Okay, we have a very, very special guest. He's worked with the biggest names and brands in sports, including the New York Yankees and Major League Baseball. He's also accomplished author with over 20 books to his name, including his latest release that came out on May 2nd, Pinstripe by, Pinstripes by the Tail, where you can find anywhere where they sell books. I'm pleased to welcome the man, the myth, the legend, Marty Appel. Marty, how are you? I'm good, Jimmy. So nice to be with you. Hope you're well. Yeah, absolutely. Love the book. Well, let's start at the very beginning. Where did your love of the Yankees begin? In an odd way. I was seven years old. I was living in Brooklyn. And my first awareness of baseball was the Brooklyn Dodgers winning their only World Series in 1955. Well, little me, I saw people literally dancing in the streets and celebrating in Brooklyn. But for my seven-year-old mind, I was like feeling terrible for the underdogs, those poor Yankees. How are they going to get over this? I didn't realize the history that the Yankees always won. So I adopted the Yankees as my team that very day. And in a sense, my whole life has been a mistake because I should have been a Dodgers fan. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Dodgers playing well uh, in the past five years, but that makes a lot of sense. Rooting for the underdog. I love that. Um, <laughs> you started working for the Yankees at 19 years old. You were working as a mail clerk and you were answering fan letters for Mickey Mantle. What was it like? Well, like everybody else in New York, Mickey was godlike. You know, the idea that I would actually interface with him on an almost daily basis was unimaginable. I remember I would drive home at night and think to myself, Mickey Mantle knows my name. How could that be? <laughs> but I would always save up a few fan letters to go over with him in person. So I'd have some real quality time with him. And he saw right through my scam because none of those letters really required his input. Uh, but he liked me as a result of that, I think. And we stayed friends for the rest of his life. That's amazing. That's just made it amazing. Um, what was the most unusual fan mail you ever got when you were working for Mickey? You know what? People expect some really bizarre or outlandish answer to that, but it was really dull. Almost every single letter was, Dear Mickey, you're my favorite player. Please send me an autographed baseball. Those were the letters. And I'd work like eight hours a day answering those letters. But I made myself available to the rest of the PR department to do whatever came along. So I had genuine input into planning old timers days in the late 60s. And they saw that I was a little more than a fan mail clerk. So uh, when an opening became available in 1970, I was offered the position assistant PR director at the time. I took it became a full-time Yankee employee. And uh, just a few years later, Mr. Steinbrenner made me the PR director of the team at age 23. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Who was the most fascinating Yankees player that you ever encountered? Um, I would say Catfish Hunter, who at the time was the biggest name in baseball because he was the first major free agent and every team was bidding for him, and it was all over the news every day, and the Yankees got him. And he was this peanut farmer from North Carolina, never went to college, didn't really know what to expect, and he was such a man's man. The respect that went out to him, he had a great sense of humor, he fit in the clubhouse perfectly, he was a player's player, but there was a dignity to him, and a sense of character. I love being in his presence. That's amazing. That's amazing. Catfish Hunter. I mean, I looked at throughout the book, you just, it, your experiences are with everyone, um, including Derek Jeter and Joe DiMaggio. Uh, can you share a story about either of them or both of them? Well, Jeter was the personification of perfection on the ball field. He just did everything right. He did interviews perfectly. He just looked the part. It amazes me that he would hit a lot of big home runs in the postseason and elsewhere. And you never, he never went to bat where you were watching him and you thought home run. 
I mean, he wasn't exactly Aaron Judge. But yet he's third all time in postseason homers. I think he's still in the top 10 on the Yankees in lifetime home runs. And he would just rise to the occasion and deliver. Uh, if you were writing a Hollywood script about the perfect player, Derek Jeter was the guy. DiMaggio needed to be cared for in a, in a big way because he was, after all, Joe DiMaggio. So, for example, the first year after Mickey Mantle retired, Mickey's popularity was so high that we just we introduced Mickey Mantle on Old Timers Day next to last, and the cheering didn't stop, and it was drowned out DiMaggio's introduction. So after that day, we decided, you know, next year, let's introduce DiMaggio next to last and Mantle last, so DiMaggio gets the full benefit of his applause. Sounded smart at the time. It was an awful decision because Joe was so insulted that he swore he'd never come back again. And he did, fortunately, and we talked him into it and we always introduced him last. But um, Mickey could have been introduced with Phil Linz, uh, you know, in the beginning of the announcements, it wouldn't have bothered him at all. But Joe had this self-imposed dignity that you had to respect. Yeah, that's fair. I think that they call that in WWE like a pop, the pop that they, that they get from the fans. So, I mean, it makes sense. Coming after Mickey Mano is probably really, really tough to do when you're being uh, announced to Yankee Stadium. Uh, that makes a lot of... Mickey's fans were so much younger and louder and emotional. DiMaggio's were older now, politely applause. Um, so I thought at the time it made sense what we did, but it didn't register well. <laughs> what, what about as like the Yankees PR director? You, you eventually became the PR director uh, and you were doing it. What do you, what do you, these fans were so rabid. I, I'm, I would consider myself a rabid Yankees fan. Um, I live and die by every single pitch. As a PR director, do you like that? Do you hate that? Because you're living and dying on every single pitch. But that does add to the content, more eyeballs. Um, so what was that like? Well, first of all, we're just glad they're there. And we're glad that there are passionate fans. I mean, there are some cultural things in America that go on, but nobody really has a passion for it. And when baseball has hit a downtime, like it did really in the mid to late 60s, some of us in the game used to think like, oh, someday this could become like opera with just older people supporting the classics. But it overcame that and it's enormously popular. And the beauty of the baseball season is that it is so long. So that as we're doing this podcast right now, um, the Yankees are going through a difficult time without Judge and Stanton in the lineup, but they're hanging in there. And you think there's so many months still to play, great things could still happen. Yeah, and I think always I thought June 14th is flag day. You can wave the white flag if you're 10 games under. So I hear you from that standpoint. From my standpoint, unfortunately, I have... All right, let's 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 do it this way. You're let's pretend I hire you as PR director for me and my Twitter account, who seems to bash Aaron Boone daily. I mean, yesterday they're down, they're up six nothing. Garrett Cole is on the mound. Seven straight batters, he looked like he struggled. Aaron Boone leaves him out to dry. On one hand, you say leave Garrett Cole out there; he's the best pitcher you have. On the other hand, it was quite clear that after the third, after the third or fourth batter, you could tell it was time for him to come out. But Boone's management of the bullpen, or really maybe his lack of being able to really pull the strings that he wants. Do you think that has as as my PR director? Do you think I should chill out on the tweets or do you think I should continue bringing 100% of my energy and my thoughts because I'm kind of in a weird spot where I want to show the fans exactly what to believe. But on the other hand, what they want to see is the fire Aaron Boone tweets. Well, 
Um, most managers will tell you that the most difficult job of a manager is managing the pitching staff. Um, you're thinking ahead. I got to save this guy for tomorrow. Or I got to, you know, limit the pitch count on this guy for his next start. There's so much going on, and it's so easy to be second guessed as soon as a guy makes, you know, connects well off of you. So I don't envy. I, I good for the managers who have those jobs. There's only thirty of them, but I don't envy the second guessing and uh, all that goes with that. I mean, Boone's accomplishment making the playoff every year he's been the Yankee manager, making the postseason, is unprecedented what he's done that. But uh, the fans are passionate. They expect answers. And it's very easy to jump on the guy when the pitching goes south. Who would expect Garrett Cole to, you know, blow a 6 nothing lead? But uh, it happened. Yeah, Move on absolutely. And play the next day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean – I need, I do need to chill out when it comes to all that stuff. I just think that sometimes the game script and the thought process is more down the road than instead of being present, but that's coming from a fan's point of view completely. And it's, it's, it is easy for me to say what's Aaron Boone doing every single time something goes wrong. I did happen to say though, like Garrett Cole looks tired. It just seems like he's not allowed to go away from the game script at all but i'll leave it at that we're keeping the positivity we'll keep the positivity it's not june 14th yet it's not flag day yet so i'll keep all the positivity my favorite person within the yankees organization of all time is george steinbrenner so maybe sometimes i feel like my voice comes through george maybe a little bit but um he was such a unique character. Uh, what was he like? Uh, and what was your favorite moment that you ever had with him? Well, it's no secret he was a tough boss. But I've come to realize with the passage of time, the media loved him, with a few exceptions, but the media loved him because he was always a great copy. He'd always have quotes and controversy, and it was a pleasure to cover that guy because he always had was always making news. The fans actually loved him. Sometimes they'd boo him, but basically he always gave them a great team. The players loved him because he paid them so well and he surrounded them with great teammates. Other teams loved him, even though he drove salaries high, because when the Yankees would come to town, it would fill their ballparks. Advertisers loved him because of the attention he drew to the Yankees and hence to the advertisers. So for the 35 or 40 of us working for a tough boss in the Yankee front office, who really cares? <laughs> he delivered in so many ways. And one thing that he never really gets full credit for is the branding of the New York Yankees. He knew from the day he got there what special, how special it was, that NY logo, the top hat logo. Today, you travel anywhere in the world and people are wearing Yankee caps. And he foresaw that 50 years ago, before there was even the word branding. So that was a great thing he did, which he seldom, it's seldom mentioned when people talk about him. Yeah, he was unbelievable. I mean, I can't even imagine if what was going on right now and he were still alive, I cannot imagine the content that we would get out of him. If he was living in a Twitter world, an age of social media, I mean, it would just be unbelievable because, you know, I mean, he, Boone would probably be not be here right now. And that's not even really a knock at Boone. That's just the knock at him being like, we're going to win the World Series or you're going to be out of here. And I think, I mean, who really knows with Cashman because Cashman and George had such a good relationship and the Steinbrenners have such a really good relationship with Cashman that Cashman really seems like he's going to be a lifer, whether or not he's going to be the general manager forever or not. That's a different thing, but he could become the president of operations or a different title, which would make more sense. But as far as the manager, I feel like George would have had a uh, boon out of here by now, but I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say positive. Um, I love the book. Um, and you've written 20, which is, incredible it really is incredible pinstripes by the tail what did you look when you were researching what 
new stuff did you learn about the New York Yankees that you hadn't known in the past? Well, it didn't take a lot of research, Jimmy, because it all came from my memory. I actually wrote the book in four weeks. Oh, my God. I didn't have to do research. I didn't have to do interviews. They were just stories that I tell to friends over dinner or whatever. So it just flowed quickly. When I was younger, uh, I used to enjoy books that had short tales, lots of white space, lots of pictures, and were just pleasant to read in that sense. And that's what I was looking to capture here. And I think we did it. Um, I had a great editor. The first conversation I had with her, I said, look, you're going to tell me the stories need to connect better. There needs to be a thread that takes one story to the next. And I said to her, Michelle, I knew you were going to say that. Here's the deal. Um, They don't connect. Picture five guys sitting around a table at Applebee's telling baseball stories. Nobody cares if they connect or not. You just jump from one to another. And that's the way the book came to be, came to read. That's why I could do it in four weeks. And um, some of the things I learned from it was coming to appreciate a little more by putting it in print, some of the figures in Yankee history who maybe didn't get enough attention at the time. Like Yogi Berra, there's a great new documentary movie out about him. Yogi should be in the conversation when we talk about Ruth Gehrig, DiMaggio, and Mantle. Yogi was right up there with them, won 10 world championships, three MVPs, Hall of Fame, and who else has a U.S. postage stamp, a Presidential Medal of Freedom, the only player to have fought a D-Day at Normandy, and um, took two teams to the World Series, the Yankees and the Mets, uh, and a documentary film about him now in theaters. So the appreciation for Yogi Berra needs to grow even more than people remember him as, remembering him as a funny guy. Absolutely. I mean, you're right. You're absolutely right. I have a, I have a Yogi Berra uh, uh, t-shirt jersey. I, I mean, I was, ta- I was taught well by my father. We had the Yogiism books. We had the, you know, we, we had, you name it. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we had books that you wrote pretty much growing up. So uh, yeah, I, I love Yogi Berra, uh, you know, get, get to a fork in the road. You take it, all the stuff. But yeah, you're absolutely right. He was a phenomenal baseball player. And uh, yeah, and it, the, the sad thing is he was such a good man that some people some people know him for that as well. So yeah, we got to check out that movie as well. Uh, definitely got to check out that movie. Um, throughout your career, you had a variety of roles for the Yankees, including PR director and television producer. What was your favorite and why? Well, I love working for the Yankees as PR director because I grew up, as I said earlier, a Yankee fan. So here was I was transitioning from being a fan to being an employee. And it was a pretty simple uh, transition. Now, I started at 19. And in those days, the late 60s, the early 70s, baseball wasn't very cool among my age group. So I was hired because they couldn't find anybody else They needed Mickey Mantle's mail answered. I had written a letter looking for a summer job. And I was the only letter they got. And they had all this unanswered fan mail. So um, I sort of defied my generation, which was moving on to basketball and football in greater number, by being a loyal Yankee fan and a baseball fan. And I had an eye for history. I knew even at 19 and 20, that everything that was going on around me was of interest to baseball fans and Yankee fans. It might seem trivial to somebody who doesn't follow the sport, but I knew it was important to people. So the assignment of uniform numbers and lockers and what went into decisions, all of that to me was, I knew, going to be interesting to people. And that's a lot of what makes up Pinstripes by the Tail the stories that I had a sense uh, were going to resonate with deep fans at some point. Um, Having said that, I loved my time working for 
WPIX Channel 11 as the TV producer, partly because I stayed connected with the Yankees, but also the television industry is fascinating. I loved being in that industry. I hadn't fully appreciated it in the years that I was working on the Yankees side. So I loved my years at Channel 11 and producing those games. That's awesome. Yeah. I, so I work in television. I work at CBS Sports. I've been doing some games over at Yes Network. Um, so yeah, I, I love television as well, but it does seem like being the PR director for the Yankees kind of kind of beats that. It, it beats that. And uh, yeah, and not even in a, you know, you, you could take whatever road you want to in life, but that seems pretty cool. Like designating or just like being able to like ask Anthony Volpe, what number do you want to wear and being in the know at every single step of the way. So yeah, that's really, really, really cool. Um, I should you add, you know, a lot of people think I'm George Costanza. So, uh, <laughs> cause Costanza's job on Seinfeld was pretty close to mine and the office was the same with the windows overlooking the field. And I met Jason Alexander a few years ago and he had been primed because we met and he said, I understand you're Costanza. <laughs> so we had a wonderful conversation. That's unreal. That's really, really cool. What do you hope that uh, readers and fans take away from your latest book, uh, Pinstripe by the Tail? Um, entertainment, largely. I mean, there's not anything controversial in there. Uh, it's really just sweet stories and funny stories and sentimental stories and getting to know the Yankee players better. Um, one guy who continues to touch my heart every time I see him is Donnie Baseball, Don Mattingly. Now, when I saw the Yogi Berra movie, there's a lot of people doing short sound bites in the movie over and over and over, to maybe 50 people. But when Mattingly came on the screen, I suddenly felt, oh, love Donnie Baseball. And he was my son's favorite player growing up. So we shared that. He had his Hitman poster in his room. And I just love Donnie's work ethic and the dignity with which he carried himself. So although I was the TV producer, not the PR director when Mattingly was playing, I had such respect for him. I just admire the guy. Enough, like it reminds me of when I was a kid and I was in the Bobby Richardson fan club. I feel like I'd be in the Don Manningly fan club now if there was one. Absolutely. He was my introduction to baseball. So the reason why I'm a Yankees fan is because of Don Manningly. So good. yeah, I love Don Manningly and uh, I'd love to see him back being the manager for the Yankees and winning a title here would be outstanding. Um, yeah, now he's up in Toronto. He needs to come back to New York. He really does. He, he, he belongs in New York. All right. We're going to do a quick segment called fill in the blank. I just hit you with a quick question and you answer the question. Simple as that. Um, blank is the greatest baseball player I have ever seen play. Well, I didn't see Babe Ruth, of course, but I would say Willie Mays. And uh, it was his birthday yesterday or Saturday. and. Um, he could do it all. He was a six-tool player, the sixth tool being on-field leadership, where he sort of managed the team from center field, positioning players. Such a great instinct for the game. So I loved Mickey Mantle, but Mickey himself said Willie was the best. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Every single person that I – athletes, when I see those interviews – I mean, Whit Mays comes up more than more often than not as uh, a top five player for sure. So that makes a lot of sense. And he had 500 home runs and he could catch the ball so well and athletic, um, unbelievable player. All right, next question. The Yankees will finish with a blank record this year. Whoa. Can I just say winning? <laughs> That's fair. Yes, you can fill in the blank any way you want. A winning record. That that's fair. I mean, it's a little bit of a cop out, a tiny bit of a cop out, but I'll I'll allow it. I'll definitely allow it for sure. Uh, yeah, that's perfectly fair. Um, so Aaron Judge is coming back on Tuesday. Um, 
Aaron Judge will finish with blank home runs this season. 40. Wow. That's just a guess. Um, yeah. Well, after Roger Maris hit 61, I think he hit 33 or something the following year. The expectations shouldn't just be that high. Aaron Judge is the key guy in the lineup. And if he hits 40 home runs, you've given us a good season, especially having missed these games right now. So I don't, the UPI called Roger Maris the flop of the year when he hit 33 home runs in 62. Aaron Judge is not going to be the flop of the year if he hits 40 home runs. Uh, there's a leadership component to him that just overrides anything else. It'll be great to have him back. Yeah, I love that man with all my heart. He's so amazing. Um, all right, final question. And everybody go out and get the book, Pinstripes by the Tail. I'm telling you, this is the one right here, people. This is the book. And go get Marty's stuff. Marty, again, thanks for coming on. Um, if you could have dinner with any three Yankees players, living or dead, who would they be and why? Well, Babe Ruth, because I think he'd pick up the check. <laughs> Joe DiMaggio for his dignity. I think you'd have to be careful what you say in Joe's presence, but uh, I would say Joe DiMaggio. And I'd say Donnie Baseball. Be great to have Don Mattingly there. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. That's great. I didn't know if you were going to say Yogi Berra, but yeah, that makes sense. Those are three really good answers. And you can't. If I have time, Jimmy. Yeah. There's a story in the book about Yogi and dinner and Yogi once. Sure. Said, yeah, absolutely. Yogi said in my presence, I once had dinner with Joe and Marilyn. And I'm like, what? You had dinner with Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe? Yogi, I have to know everything about this. Give me every little detail you can remember. And he said, well, you know how when you order a shrimp cocktail, you usually get four shrimp? That night we got eight. That was all he remembered. <laughs> That's unreal. Unreal. That's amazing. I mean, you've had the life. You've had the life. Marty Appel, you are the absolute man. Thank you so much for joining me. And everybody, again, go get Pinstripes by the tail. Buy it, buy it, buy it. It's everywhere where you can buy books. Thanks again. Thank you. Great being with you, Jimmy.